Okay, we will no move now to discuss jaundice in neonates and children. What is jaundice? So jaundice is a clinical sign that means um, yellowish discoloration of uh, skin, sclera, and mucous membranes, which is caused by accumulation of bilirubin when it's above the normal uh, range. In a newborn, you can start to notice signs of jaundice and sclera uh, when bilirubin levels level reaches five milligram per deciliter. So sclera is the first location where you observe jaundice, and it is also the last place uh, from which uh, jaundice disappear. The prevalence of jaundice. Jaundice is one of the most common uh, manifestations or pathologies that we face in our practice. It's very common in both term uh, newborns and inf uh, newborns and preterm newborns. About 60% of term newborns and 80% of preterm will have a bilirubin level of more than five milligram per deciliter in the first week of life. Uh, as I said before, if you remember in the last lecture that uh, usually physiological jaundice doesn't tend to appear in the first 24 hours of life. So if a patient or a baby is newborn, develops jaundice in the first hours of life, this is unlikely physiological, this is most likely pathological, and you need to find out the cause and manage accordingly. In a term infant, Physiological jaundice can rarely exceed a level of 15 milligram <clears throat> per deciliter, okay? Um, if it exceeds this number, you have to look for underlying cause or you have to think of a pathological cause of jaundice. Why do we need to um, diagnose and treat ja jaundice prom promptly? Um, jaundice, as I said, is a result of bilirubin accumulation. Bilirubin is divided into two types, direct and indirect. The problem is mainly with indirect bilirubin. We'll discuss this later. It, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and can cause neurological problems, or what we call it carnectoris, especially when bilirubin level, levels exceed 25 milligram per deciliter. Actually, kids with carnectoris will end up with permanent neurological sequelae like uh, spasticity, and um, movement disorders. Okay, how does jaundice um, appear and what's the um, bilirubin metabolism pathway? So it all starts with the heme molecule. Uh, let's say if we've got hemolysis of RBCs, this heme will be oxidized by heme oxygenase and this will give rise to biliverdin. And then biliverdin will uh, be reduced by biliverdin reductase, uh, giving rise to unconjugated bilirubin or water-soluble uh, bilirubin. This unconjugated bilirubin will further be um, phosphorylated by UDBGT, which means uh, uridine 5-diphosphoglucouranosyl transferase. So this is the enzyme uh, that functions basically to uh, transform unconjugated bilirubin into conjugated form. So this enzyme will conjugate the bilirubin. So conjugated bilirubin, because it is water-soluble, it will be excreted with bile into our bowels and intestines. And then our intestinal microflora and bacteria will turn this bilirubin into urobilinogen. Now, this urobilinogen will be um, moved or reabsorbed from the intestines, go back to uh, the kidney and get excreted in the urine, forming urinary urobilinogen. It gives the color, the urine its color. And then a small portion of that doesn't get resorbed to the blood and the kidney, it will go back uh, to the liver to start all over again. Part of it will uh, turn into stercobilin in the bowel, and this stercobilin is what gives stool its brown color. So in the absence of stercobilin, if it's not present at all, if we've got a problem with delivering bilirubin into our bowel, you'll have colorless stool or clay-colored stool. 
So the difference between conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin, this uh, this is a very important uh, chart that you need to look at. So conjugated bilirubin is water soluble um, because it's water soluble because it's not lipid soluble. It can't cross the blood brain barrier. So our problem is basically with the unconjugated bilirubin, which is lipid soluble and thus can cross the blood brain barrier and cause problems. Um, conjugate bilirubin because it is water soluble, it can be excreted by bowel and then uh, through urine. However, the unconjugated bilirubin, we can't excrete it in urine. That's why its accumulation will cause problems in the body. However, we say that conjugate, our problem is mainly caused by unconjugated uh, lipid soluble. However, conjugated bilirubin, if it's at high levels, the conjugate bilirubin can still cause problems and it can become toxic uh, to our body. So we classify jaundice into, as I said, physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice. Physiological jaundice, we will learn about it uh, in details. It's always a diagnosis of exclusion. So you, we don't make assumptions that this is physiological or this is pathological. What we do is that when we have a baby with jaundice, like deeply jaundice, significant jaundice, we need to rule out underlying pathologies, specifically if the patient presents in the first 24 hours of life or the first hours uh, after birth. We further divide bilirubin or hyperbilirubinemia into unconjugated and uh, conjugated, and we have to pay attention to the onset at which uh, jaundice appears or starts. So physiological jaundice, again, this is an, um, a diagnosis of exclusion. So why does it happen? So there's no underlying pathology. Everything is fine. The liver is fine. Um, UD GPT enzyme is fine. Uh, the metabolic pathway of uh, bilirubin is all okay, but the baby is jaundiced. So why is that? So newborn babies, specifically prematures, they have a very uh, short lifespan of RBCs, which means that the turnover of RBCs are very high. So continuous destruction of old RBCs, and then him will be, as we explained, will turn other eventually into bilirubin and accumulate in tissues. Uh, the RBC mass in neonates is high, okay, and it starts to gradually decrease with age. Uh, also, newborn, specifically immature babies, where the incidence of hyperbilirubinemia is higher than in terms, we say that it's about 60% in term and 80% in preterm babies, they have immature ligandin. What is ligandin? Ligandin is a binding protein that binds bilirubin, carry it to be excreted out of the body. So with the absence of ligandin, it will still accumulate in our tissues and cause uh, hyperbilirubinemia. Again, uh, newborn, just born babies, specifically uh, premature ones, they have less um, concentration or less production of the UDPGT, which is the enzyme required for the conjugation uh, of, bilirubin, of bilirubin. Um, again, the, the flora or microflora in a newborn gut is not optimal when they are first uh, born. So um, the rates at which biliverdin is transferred into stercobilinogen is less, So, which means less excretion of bilirubin through stool, means accumulation in the tissues and jaundice. Uh, the liver function is still also not optimal when the babies are uh, when babies are uh, initially born. That's why. So these are the reasons to why newborn babies are more liable to have physiological jaundice. So the onset is very important, as we said. Hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice in the first hours of life, you need to rule out pathological uh, jaundice. In term babies, the peak level of uh, hyperbilirubinemia is reached around the day three of life, and they rarely, it rarely exceeds the level of 13 milligram or 12 milligram per deciliter, rarely reaching 15 milligram per deciliter. However, in premature baby, this peak is higher, so instead of 12, it's 15 milligram per deciliter, and it's more delayed. So instead of having the peak of hyperbilirubinemia at day three, they have it at day five, sometimes uh, continues for a longer period of time as well. Most of babies with physiological jaundice, uh, jaundice will resolve by week two. 
However, with some cases, specifically breast milk jaundice, they can still have jaundice uh, at uh, older ages, like up to the age of one month. Okay, pathological jaundice, uh, as I said, usually appears in the first hours of life, and it lasts for more than two weeks. Um, when do we suspect pathological jaundice, or what are the features of this, uh, pathological jaundice? Usually the increment rate of bilirubin is high. So we're talking about more than 0.5 milligram per day, per day, per hour. Um, and the peak bilirubin level is more than 30 milligram per deciliter in term infants and more than 15 in preterm infants. Um, it's, you have to think of pathological jaundice if the portion of the total bilirubin, uh, if direct bilirubin out of the total uh, uh, portion is more than 1.5 milligram per deciliter. So direct bilirubin should be less around one or less of total uh, bilirubin level. If the patient has any underlying abnormalities like hepatosplenomegaly uh, or anemia, dysmorphic features, uh, thyroid problem or hypothyroidism, you need to also rule out uh, pathological jaundice. So this chart summarizes the difference between physiological and pathological. I'm not going to go through them. We've just mentioned all, most of, uh, of it. This is a very important chart that you need to, or table that you need to look at. So cause, causes of pathological jaundice. It, so pathological jaundice might be caused by either increased production of uh, bilirubin or our body is unable to excrete or get rid of uh, bilirubin or increase enterohepatic circulation. By that we mean the enterohepatic circulation is prolonged, okay? So uh, biliverdin stays for longer periods in the intestines, which means that more of it will be reabsorbed back to our body and to the liver, okay? So with increased production causes like hemolytic diseases, either ABO incompatibility or RH incompatibility, polycythemia, uh, rubravera, uh, and hematomas or enclosed hemorrhages. If you remember initially when we discussed the difference between caput succedaneum and cephalohematoma, we say that patient with large cephalohematoma and large blood accumulation might present with jaundice due to hemolysis of this uh, uh, enclosed hemorrhage. Uh, second pathophysiology or cause of hyperbilirubinemia is decreased clearance. So our body can't get rid of bilirubin, and this is mainly related to our inability to conjugate uh, bilirubin, basically. Some causes that can overwhelm our liver, our enzymes, and our body and interfere with the excretion might include sepsis, um, perinatal asphyxia, so babies with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, premature babies, as we mentioned, hypothyroidism, Crigler-Najjar syndrome, and others. Increased enterohepatic circulation. This is commonly seen in breast milk jaundice. This is not pathological, this is physiological, breastfeeding jaundice, and gastrointestinal obstruction. So amongst those, only gastrointestinal obstruction is considered pathological. Obstructive causes. So bile is not, um, moves freely out of the biliary system to the intestine, then out of the body. This is mainly related to something obstructing the bile ducts, like in biliary atresia, uh, colidocal cysts, or congenital infections like in sepsis that can, uh, and torch infections that might cause uh, biliary stasis, uh, which is uh, slowing down of uh, the biliary flow and clearance. Structurally abnormal RBCs, again, this is uh, hemolysis related. So abnormal RBCs will be recognized by our reticular endothelial system like the spleen, and they will get destroyed and destructed, and then we will end up having excessive amount of bilirubin accumulating in tissues like in spherocytosis. Inhibition of uh, conjugation, this might be indigenous or exogenous. So patients who have or who receive specific treatment or drugs like sulfonamides and vitamin K, this can interfere with conjugation. Other causes like thyroxine deficiency, do we know why? So thyroxine uh, hormone uh, increases the activity of glucuracil transferase, which is the enzyme required for uh, conjugation of bilirubin. So when we have decreased thyroxine level, 
conjugation will be um, interrupted or decreased, and this will lead to accumulation of bilirubin and hyperbilirubinemia. And some metabolic diseases that present with uh, pathological joints like galactosemia. Okay, so we say that we further classify hyperbilirubinemia into direct and indirect. So with indirect bilirubinemia, شو حكينا الindirect شو الفرق بينه وبين الdirect unconjugated okay lipid soluble so lipid soluble can cross the blood brain barrier and can cause issues in newborns like carnectitis so causes of indirect hyperbilirubinemia include hemolysis we mentioned them and there are non hemolytic uh, causes like physiological jaundice, breastfeeding, breast milk jaundice, and some rare entities that you have to keep uh, under your radar and not to forget about, like uh, glucuronyl transferase uh, enzyme deficiency, which we see in Krigerel Najjar syndrome, Gilbert syndrome, uh, and others. So we'll start with hemolysis related. So in a newborn baby, why would a newborn have hemolysis of their RBC, abnormal hemolysis. So the first and the most common reason is ABO incompatibility. So when the mother's blood type is O, which means the mom doesn't have either of the A or B antigen, and the baby is either A plus or A positive or B positive, now, during pregnancy, uh, there's what we call fetal maternal hemorrhage. There might be some leak of fetal blood to the maternal circulation. Actually, recent studies showed that uh, the mom can still have fragments of her baby's DNA lifelong. Okay, so this fetal maternal hemorrhage means some of the fetus blood will go to the maternal circulation. Now, the mom will recognize that these RBCs are foreign bodies because they are showing antigens that her RBCs are not showing. So thus, the immune system will start producing antibodies against the RBCs. Now, the problem with ABO incompatibility is that uh, even the first pregnancy or the first baby can still be affected. This happens for so many reasons. One of them is that ABO incompatibility or these antigens, you might be exposed to them even before getting pregnant. Some of the causes to why you get exposed to them is bacteria. Some bacteria do have these antigens and you may not have them. So a mom might have been exposed to a bacteria and then developed uh, anti-A or anti-B antibodies already in her circulation. And then the memory immune cells, when they... Uh, like when, when they attract these RBCs, the fetal RBCs, immediately remember that they need to produce antibodies towards them and then hemolysis starts uh, in the first pregnancy. So uh, the onset of ABO incompatibility starts as birth immediately. That's why, as we said, if you encounter a baby with jaundice in the early hours of life, you have to rule out pathological causes like ABO incompatibility. Those will show signs of um, antibodies produced, because this is immune-mediated hemolysis, which means you need to check for the presence of direct comb test or direct comb antibody. Okay, so these are antibodies attaching themselves to the surface of RBCs, causing their destruction. We need to monitor those patients because this um, ABO incompatibility can cause significant anemia that needs to be treated either with blood transfusion, which we try to avoid, or iron supplementation. RH incompatibility. So if the mother mother's blood group is RH negative, she doesn't have the rhesus factor, and the baby is RH positive, now, should we say that fetal maternal he hemorrhage happens during first pregnancy and thus the baby should be affected, the first baby? No. So fetal maternal hemorrhage that happens in the first pregnancy is not enough to elicit sufficient numbers of antibody production. So the first baby is usually safe. However, with subsequent pregnancies, memory cells will start producing antibodies that the mom was exposed to in the first pregnancy, and then hemolysis starts uh, intra, 
intrauterine. So the fetus might have significant hemolysis, significant anemia, end up with heart failure, high drops vitalis, um, and this is this might cause uh, mortality or stillbirth. <coughs> So babies on exam, they might have signs of congestive heart failure and hepatosplenomegaly due to the overwhelming hemolysis. So mom or mothers uh, known to have, known to be RH negative, they need to receive anti-D antibodies during pregnancy to saturate the antigens to prevent further production of antibodies uh, against the baby's RBCs. One of the common uh, in our region reason, reasons for hemolysis is G6PD deficiency. G6PD stands for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. This is a very important enzyme and factor that uh, protects our cells from oxidative stress. So the main function of G6PD enzyme is to maintain proper uh, uh, levels of NADPH enzyme. NADPH in its turn uh, maintains proper levels of glutathione. Glutathione is very important to protect our RBCs from oxidative stress, as in cases of infection, sepsis, or drug exposure, etc. So if a patient doesn't have this optimal level of G6PD or have G6PD deficiency, they will end up having significant hemolysis when they are exposed to stress because their RBCs can't cope with stress, okay? RBC hemolysis, then hyperbilirubinemia, right? So G6PD is very common in our region. It's an X-linked uh, disorder, which means males are more affected than males. However, maybe you studied that in genetics due to lionization. Women or females can still have the disease, but with, with much milder uh, form. So they present as early as the first hours of uh, life. Uh, we consider uh, we consider delivery as a stressful condition for the baby. Resuscitation is a stressful condition for the baby. So babies can this can elicit uh, RBC hemolysis as an oxidative uh, stress. They present with rapid rapid uh, drop. Uh, in their hemoglobin, uh, anemia, hemoglobinuria, and jaundice. This again needs proper evaluation and management as soon as possible to prevent the toxic effects of uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, how to diagnose G6PD? So we said if a patient develops uh, or uh, presents with hyperbilirubinemia, we need to rule out secondary or pathological causes. Tamam. One of the blood tests that you need to measure is you have to rule out G6PD, as I said, because it's very common in our region. So then G6PD levels. However, this can be misleading. Initially, when there is hemolysis, RBCs, they like release what the G6PD enzyme um, when they get destructed. So we measure the enzyme in the destructed RBCs. So you might have normal G6PD levels. However, this doesn't rule out G6PD. So we have to repeat the level after the resolution or stabilization of uh, hemolysis. How to treat? So someone with G6PD, who is tafawal? Hada fikum ando tafawal? Or hada bismaan hada ando tafawal? So the most important uh, factor in treating is to, to do primary prevention, to prevent that from happening. So to stay away from any stressful conditions. Uh, if there's an infection, treat as soon as possible. Uh, a baby with infection should be treated um, ASAP. However, some uh, antibiotics need to be, uh, or some drugs need to be avoided. Any drugs with sulfa is considered a stress, um, an oxidant uh, uh, will cause uh, oxidative stress and hemolysis. Um, uh, other like uh, anti-malarial drugs are, should also be avoided. They should avoid fava beans, for example. And if they have anemia, they should be treated for their anemia. One of the inherited uh, causes of uh, pathological jaundice is craig lenagar syndrome. It's an autosomal recessive uh, disorder. What does autosomal recessive mean? You need two copies of the mutated gene, and because it's a recessive, it can skip generations. 
So you may see it uh, in one generation that can skip one, two, three generations and then appear again. So in Kruger Nadjar, there's a permanent deficiency in glucuronyl transferase, which is the enzyme responsible of con conjugation of bilirubin. It has two types, type 1 and type 2. So the gold standard to diagnose it is by sending um, genetics. However, uh, we give a test, we, we do phenobarb um, response test to define whether this is uh, type 1 or type 2. If we give phenobarb and this, and this leads to increased um, enzymatic production, this is type 2 or uh, phenobarb responsive type of Kriglan Ajar. If the patient doesn't respond after administering phenobarb, this is type 1. And the patient will have persistent hyperbilirubinemia. The problem with this type, type 1, is that it can cause significant and rapid rise in, uh, rise in, hype in, bilirubin, in bilirubin levels, which is indirect, which is neurotoxic, ending up with kernicterus. Gilbert disease, um, there's um, a mutation in one region, uh, one promoter region of the glucuronyl transferase. This again is a common, is a less common cause of indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, however, so those patients, they don't present with significant or severe uh, hyperbilirubinemia. Sometimes uh, patients do come and complain of, like in adulthood, of yellow sclera. They say, my sclera is always yellow. I never have bright uh, white sclera. They might turn out to have Gilbert syndrome. So it's very, it, it doesn't cause any significant uh, clinical manifestations. However, if something else is imposed on top that causes hyperbilirubinemia, like any uh, hemolytic, other hemolytic cause, this might, inc they, this might cause moderate to severe uh, manifestation or presentation. So breastfeeding jaundice. So this is a very, very, very common problem uh, we face in clinics, especially when um, women do deliver or give birth for the first time. They're not experienced with breastfeeding. They don't know um, how to maintain the proper latching of the baby. They don't know uh, how frequent uh, they should um, breastfeed their babies. So they present with what's called breastfeeding jaundice, and it's different from breast milk jaundice. So breastfeeding jaundice is basically related to how much of a volume uh, a newborn baby receives. So this depends, again, uh, on the adequacy of uh, breast milk that's being produced by uh, by the mum. So this is a form that we see, we don't see in the first hours of life because it's an accumulative effect of a poorly fed infant. So they usually manifest on day three or four of life. It's very common, as I said. So as I said, the pathophysiology is basically dehydration or insufficient uh, breast milk production. This will lead to increase or prolonged enterohepatic circulation. So as we said, more bilirubin will be reabsorbed back to our body rather than being excreted because it stays longer period in our bowel. So our bowel will have um, a chance to resorb or resorb more of the bilirubin back to our body. The management is to encourage women to uh, more, re more frequent uh, breastfeeding. Uh, old schools used to say uh, administer formula milk. This is wrong, okay? Uh, breast milk is liquid gold, so we don't substitute it with any other form of milk. We just encourage women to express uh, their breast milk more frequently, to hydrate well, to frequently um, breastfeed their babies because frequent breastfeeding will stimulate more uh, breast milk production. Now, breast milk jaundice, it's different. It doesn't have to do with the volume of milk produced or how frequent a mom uh, feeds her infant. It's basically related to uh, the presence of beta glucuronidase protein in her body or enzyme in her body. Um, this is considered um, an inhibitor for bilirubin conjugation. This is number one. So it might interfere with bilirubin conjugation. Number two, it might cause prolongation of the enterohepatic circulation. 
and as a result, hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, um, it's 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 less common than the uh, breast feeding jaundice. How to treat? Again, all the schools used to say interrupt feeding for one to two days breastfeeding and shift the baby totally to uh, formula milk and then watch for improvement. This is wrong. This shouldn't be done uh, because breast milk jaundice can rarely reach uh, a high level. So it's not um, worrisome, okay? Even if the baby stays uh, jaundice, we just do regular check on their bilirubin level just to make sure that it doesn't exceed 15 milligram per deciliter uh, and we doesn't need phototherapy. But we don't stop breastfeeding for any reason. Uh, as I said, usual physiological jaundice tends to uh, resolve in the first two weeks or by week two of life. However, breast milk jaundice can still be apparent uh, up to three months of life. Okay, now moving to direct hyperbilirubinemia. So it's divided, so it's classified according to the cause. So hepatic causes like hepatitis and neonates or idiopathic autoimmune hepatitis and neonates uh, and congenital infections like uh, neonatal sepsis, early on sepsis or torch infections, uh, inborn error of metabolism like galactosemia, tyrosinemia or hypothyroidism or sometimes post hip hepatic cause, so something uh, standing in the way of bilirubin flow out of the biliary tract, like in the case of biliary atresia and colidocal cyst. So biliary atresia, there's total obliteration of the extrahepatic bile duct. So the flow of bile is uh, inhibited. Bile doesn't flow out to the intestine to be excreted out, okay? So they don't present immediately after life, they present when this level starts to accumulate and increase in their body at week one or end of week one or week two. They present with uh, deep jaundice, very dark urine, uh, and clay-colored stool. Why? Why clay-colored? So we say because the bilirubin doesn't flow to stercobile, yes. Um, and hepatomegaly, they present with hepatomegaly or congested uh, liver. How to diagnose? Um, the most valuable or the most sensitive is liver biopsy. However, uh, the golden standard is to do intraoperative cholangiogram. So with intraoperative cholangiogram, basically they inject the gallbladder with a form of um, uh, a dye, and this dye is radio-opaque, so it should show on X-ray. So after they inject the bladder with this dye, they, they take series of X-rays, and they show the flow uh, of the dye out of the bladder to the intestines. If this doesn't happen, this confirm um, biliary atresia, and it's, it's intraoperative because if it's positive, the patient has to be operated on as soon as possible. Success of the operation, the corrective operation, depends on how early the operation is done before any damage has happened uh, to the liver and the body tissues. The procedure that they do in, in which they do correction, it's called CASI procedure, which is hepatoporto uh, introstomy. So basically they overcome the obstructed biliary tract and they uh, initiate or create um, a tract between the liver and the intestines. But the definitive treatment is liver transplantation. So CASI is considered a bridging uh, type of treatment. So just to make sure that the patient doesn't deteriorate and to give him a chance to be optimally nourished, to be ready for liver transplantation. Other cause of obstructive uh, hyperbilirubinemia is colidocal cyst. So there's congenital dilatation of the biliary tree. Dilatation can be single or multiple, uh, can be intrahepatic or extrahepatic or both. Um, it, it's divided further into types. Most common is type cyst. They present again with deep jaundice, clay colored stool, uh, and they, the presentation might be uh, resembling that of biliary atresia. 
The problem with this is that this cyst may transform into malignant or cancer cholangic car carcinoma. So definitive treatment is surgical resection or cystectomy to uh, uh, alleviate uh, hyperbilirubinemia, to avoid any uh, tissue damage from the accumulation of bilirubin, and to prevent future cholangic carcinoma. Classification of neonatal jaundice, again, we say that we pay attention to the onset of appearance of symptoms. So if it's early, we think of hemolytic causes like ABO incompatibility, G6PD, or RH incompatibility. If it's intermediate, uh, we think of physiological jaundice, breast milk jaundice, other causes like sepsis, other causes of hemolysis, Krigler, Najjar, and um, Gilbert syndrome or polycythemia if it's late or delayed. Again, if conjugated biliary atresia and colidocal cyst, if unconjugated breast milk jaundice and hypothyroidism, trisomy 21 and cystic fibrosis. So by that, we, oh, we reviewed jaundice in a newborn. Now moving to jaundice in children, some slight uh, differences. Uh, should be reviewed now. So jaundice um, is an important early or sometimes late sign of acute and chronic liver disease in children and adolescents. Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, again, it's divided into hemolytic and non-hemolytic. We reviewed a uh, common cause of hemolytic anemia. Um, so the manifestation that present with jaundice uh, might be mild, but sometimes if it's significant, it, they can present with deep jaundice, abdominal uh, pain according to the cause, uh, splenomegaly with or without hepatomegaly. Um, urine color can vary according to severity. Uh, you ask about family history. It's very important to ask about any hemolytic disease that run in families like G6PD. Uh, the presence of reticulocytosis is important if it's positive or negative. Reticulocytosis means that the bone marrow is there, it's functioning, and it tries to overcome RBC destruction. Um, any blood film evidence of uh, hemolysis is also needs to be looked at. Uh, the presence of indirect hyperbilirubinemia, and we need to check uh, the liver enzymes as well. Again, if one of the tests that we need to send is a Combs test or direct Combs test, if it's positive, we will think about immune-mediated hemolysis like ABO and RH incompatibility, lupus-related uh, hemolysis, or drug-induced hemolysis. If it's negative, we think about uh, G6P deficiency, uh, other hemoglobin hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell disease, hereditary spherocytosis, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and Wilson disease, because in these pathologies there is there is no anti auto antibody formation, so direct combs should be negative. So unconjugated bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia. Um, again, just to review the the common causes, the non hemolytic causes: Krigler, Najjar, Gilbert, hypothyroidism, and internal hemorrhage. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is either hepatocellular or cholestatic. Hepatocellular like um, in case of hepatocellular ca carcinoma, cancer, hepatitis. So you need to send blood uh, or laboratory evaluation to, che to check what differentials you have in mind, like liver enzymes. Um, you have to uh, check for other GI symptoms like anorexia, vomiting, and abdominal pain, which might be seen in hepatitis, for example hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, and bleeding tendency, which might point to impaired coagulopathy uh, seen in uh, liver failure, either acute, fulminant, or chronic. Um, quick review for causes of hepatocellular jaundice infectious, like in case of viral infections like viral hepatitis, um, bacteria like typhoid, brucellosis, and E. coli septicemia, or protozo protozoal infection like malaria. They all can cause uh, jaundice. Again, this uh, table reviews the common um, hepatotropic viruses and non-hepatotropic viruses that can cause uh, jaundice. Drugs, 
this is a list of drugs that can cause jaundice. You can refer to that. Uh, metabolic causes like Wilson, galactosemia, tyrosinemia, Krigranadjar uh, and Gilbert are both considered metabolic diseases. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is very rare in our region. Cholestatic jaundice. Um, there are some laboratory signs that um, guide you to the diagnosis, like increased uh, alkaline phosphatase or um, DGT. Uh, they present with deep jaundice, uh, clay-colored or pale stools, uh, dark urine, uh, itchiness or bruritis due to the accumulation of bilirubin or bile salts under skin, xanthomas, which is related to chronic uh, fat malabsorption, which is seen in chronic cholestasis and bleeding tendency. Again, divided further into uh, obstructive and hepatocellular. How to approach patients, neonates, and children with jaundice. So, you have to clinically uh, look for signs of jaundice, like discoloration of skin and sclera. How bad it is? Is the patient is covered head to toe with yellow skin, or is it just confined to the eyes, face, down to the trunk, etc. The presence of other systemic manifestations like fever and vomiting, uh, hypoactivity and ability to suck or poor feeding in a neonate that might uh, be seen in hypo congenital hypothyroidism and neonatal sepsis, patient with torch infection or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, uh, features of failure to thrive. This is in chronic liver disease. Uh, abdominal distension, which might be caused by uh, hepatospinomegaly, and clay-colored stool, which might uh, be caused by biliary obstruction. What questions do we need to ask about? Um, common questions like um, gestational age, method of delivery, history of NICU admission or not, prematurity, full term, uh, baby, so uh, this might be a guide. The onset of um, jaundice, the duration for how long it lasted, and the progression. Is it increasing with time, decreasing, or is it static? Color of urine and stool might also guide you about the underlying cause. So if the school is clay color, this is obstructive rather than prehepatic or hepatic cause. Uh, vomiting. Uh, feeding history, weightless, any maternal history of drug use, maternal infection or illnesses, the need of uh, hospitalization, for example. Uh, any family history of liver diseases, family history of hemolytic disorders, as anyone uh, with recurrent admission for blood transfusion, family members with a chronic uh, profound anemia, difficult to treat, for example. Uh, any history of um, premature rupture of membrane, which is a risk of neonatal sepsis. Any uh, family history of previous neonatal sepsis and previous siblings as well. Um, delivery history, was it sepsis delivery? Was it vacuum delivery? Was Did the baby have cephalohematoma at presentation or not? Children, older children, you ask about the duration, onset, progression, history of systemic uh, illnesses or signs and symptoms like fever. With fever, you ask whether it's associated with chills, rigor or not. If it's not associated with chills and rigor, this is seen in hepatitis. If it's associated with chills and rigor, you think of more deep uh, severe infections like liver abscesses or malaria induced hepatitis. You ask about uh, intake of specific drugs like aspirin. Um, history of abdominal pain, for example, right hypochondrial abdominal pain is seen in cholecystitis, etc. So again, important questions, history of recurrent blood transfusion, history of previous similar episodes of jaundice, uh, family history of similar conditions, uh, recent travel or uh, outbreak of hepatitis, for example. Developmental delay, seizure, abnormal behavior, they are seen basically a newborn born with carnectitis. So physical examination, um, start with putting the growth parameters, weight, height, according to the gestational age. 
you check for any pallor and signs of anemia, any abnormal rashes like petechiae, any kephalohematomas that might explain the jaundice, uh, dehydration or hydration status, weightless, uh, any temperature instability that might indicate sepsis as a trigger, hepatosplenomegaly, uh, any evidence or signs of birth injury or uh, any evidence of carnectitis. Ba babies with carnectitis, they might have an abnormal posture that we I will show you uh, in a minute. So uh, there's an index that we roughly use to estimate how high bilirubin level is. We call it Kramer's index. So if the baby or the child uh, is yellow, just the the yellowish discoloration is just confined to the upper uh, to the face and upper neck, we estimate uh, bilirubin level to be some somewhere between four and six milligram per deciliter. If it's more down, involving the chest and the upper trunk, this is eight to ten roughly. If it reaches the lower abdomen, it can be as high as 14. If it reaches the forearms and the lower legs, it uh, can be as high as 18. If it's involved the palms and the soles, which is the last area to be uh, involved in hyperbilirubinemia, this is very serious, and this uh, indicates a level of up to uh, 20 milligrams per deciliter, which might be life-threatening. Part of your physical exam uh, should be looking for abnormal odors like fetal hepaticus, uh, evaluation of the level of consciousness with the Glasgow Coma Scale, and look for any abnormal neurological signs like tremor, abnormal movement, seizure, abnormal posture, spasticity, etc. What labs do we need to send? So with regard to conjugated uh, liver function test, uh, coagulopathy, coagulation profile to rule out chronic liver disease-related coagulopathy. Sometimes we need to do ultrasound to check for the presence of the gallbladder. HIDA scan, uh, thyroid function test, we said hypothyroidism can cause both, uh, can cause direct hyperbilirubinemia. Metabolic screen, if you suspect metabolic disorders by sending urine uh, reducing substancing substances. Uh, torch infection screen and liver biopsy if you suspect um, biliary atresia. Again, we check for the serum bilirubin level. You check the top and we check the direct. Okay, so normally the direct should be one or less of the total bilirubin level. Uh, CBC with differentials, blood film, uh, blood group for both mom and the baby, direct comb test, triticulocyte count. How to treat? So treatment depends on the cause. So if the trigger of hyperbilirubinemia is sepsis, you have to treat sepsis. If it's uh, biliary atresia, this needs surgical um, intervention. But in the meanwhile, you have to make sure that the, the baby is well hydrated. Uh, you have to start phototherapy, which is mainly for indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, you might give IV immunoglobulin if you suspect immune-mediated uh, hemolysis um, and exchange transfusion if the level is very high and there's a risk of uh, carnectitis. So for neonatal jaundice, it's either phototherapy or exchange transfusion. Phototherapy, so we put babies under a light that gives um, a specific wavelength between 420 and 470. This is a common exam question. Um, the idea of this uh, therapy is to uh, convert water insoluble unconjugated bilirubin, sorry, water insoluble and conjugated get into conjugated, that the body, which is water soluble, so the body can get rid of through stool and urine. Um, the decision at which we start phototherapy depends on the gestational age of the baby, uh, the birth weight of the baby, the clinical status, and the level of uh, bilirubin, and the rate of bilirubin rise in the body. So we, there's a specific chart that we plot uh, data on. So for example, I look uh, at the patient's or the baby's uh, age, let's say 24 hours old, 
and then I check at what level this baby needs um, phototherapy and this is further broken down whether the baby has a high risk baby like babies with uh, reduced or uh, yeah, preterm babies or and just a gestational age less than 30 between 35 and 37 these are considered high risk so the level at which i start phototherapy is low so at 24 hours for a low risk baby i start phototherapy if bilirubin level is about eight okay however this is for the so these this is this is the curve for high risk babies Okay, this is intermediate risk, and the highest one is uh, low risk babies, which are well babies, no signs of sepsis, full term, gestational age around uh, 38 and more. So the threshold at which I decide to start phototherapy depends on risk factors like prematurity, sepsis, wellness of the baby, and the level of um, total serum bilirubin. Other methods of treating babies at home, if you, if the family can't uh, stay uh, in a thing, is called billy blanket. It's considered and effective, however, it's not available in our region. Uh, nothing comes, no treatment comes without a cost of side effects. Uh, phototherapy can cause, uh, cause my, sometimes significant side effects like retinal damage. So if you uh, go uh, or if you are in a um, pediatric NICU rotation, you will notice that all kids with uh, who are put under phototherapy should have their eyes covered, well covered, to uh, prevent retinal damage. Uh, dehydration because of the insensible water loss through their skin. Uh, skin rash or phototherapy dermatitis, we call it. Uh, sometimes they might end up having testicular injury. And uh, last but not least, bronze baby syndrome, as you can see. <clears throat> this is a baby who's just born. This is after five days of phototherapy. Uh, 11 days of phototherapy and then after five months. So can you see uh, the changes in um, skin color? And one of the modalities is exchange transfusion. This is preserved for babies with very high levels of bilirubin, exceeding 25 milligram per deciliter, because we want to prevent uh, connectors from happening. So basically, we give the baby uh, donor blood and we waste the baby's blood out. This requires central line to be inserted. As you can see in this photo, we're using an umbilicus uh, venous line, a UVC. Okay. Exchange transfusion, it has, it comes with significant complications like metabolic acidosis. So after we do exchange transfusion, we send regular VBG um, tests. Uh, graft versus host disease, the baby might react to the donor blood by forming antibodies and this will for will cause severe uh, hemolysis and worsening of hyperbilirubinemia because it's it, it's um, a procedure where we use a central access to the baby's blood or circulation this might cause sepsis or dissemination of skin flora or bacteria from the unit you're working with and cause sepsis uh, thrombocytopenia uh, electrolyte abnormalities like hypocalcemia and uh, hypoglycemia. So with babies with immune-mediated hemolysis like those we see in RH incompatibility or ABO, you might give the baby a dose or two of IVIG uh, to prevent the rise uh, of bilirubin uh, level and to, it's like a conjunction therapy in conjunction with phototherapy as well. Uh, in our region, our culture, uh, there's always a talk about remedies that can be done at home, like sun exposure. However, we should avoid a prolonged exposure that might cause sunburn or dehydration. However, like slight sun exposure up to 15 minutes per day is okay. 
uh, water and sugar feeding. This is very common in our community. This is very dangerous and contraindicated. It can cause dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Garlic. garlic. This is a myth. Uh, oral medications, there is no evidence that any medication can help with hyperbilirubinemia. So treatment, again, in childhood jaundice, we're not talking about neonatal jaundice now, treat the underlying cause, okay? For example, babies with underlying liver disease, um, biliary atresia, for example, you have to maintain good nutrition by giving them a diet with high medium chain triglycerides to promote their growth and um, because babies with chronic cholestasis or biliary atresia, they might have impaired uh, fat ab absorption and impaired growth. And if you are planning to do surgery, babies should be optimally nourished uh, and their weight should be at a specific uh, range below which you can't operate. For example, if the, if the underlying cause is hemolysis related to sickle cell anemia or thalassemia, the baby or the child might need a blood transfusion. Kernicterus, so this is one of the uh, fatal um, um, complications of uh, hyperbilirubinemia, which is called bilirubin encephalopathy. It's related to uh, unconjugate bilirubin, basically, that can cross the blood-brain barrier and deposit in the uh, basal ganglia and the brainstem nuclei. It happens at high levels of bilirubin, 20 milligram per deci or um, above, sometimes less in high-risk babies like those with prematurity and sepsis. Mortality rate, uh, 10%, so it's very fatal, and 70% rate of morbidity. It has phases start, that start with hypoactivity and poor sucking, ending up with high pitch cry, irritability, hearing loss, poor feeding, and acetosis or abnormal posture. Connectors, as I said, can cause uh, permanent neurological sequelae like cerebral palsy, uh, gaze palsy, sensory neuron hearing loss, and intellectual uh, delay. The treatment is to treat hyperbilirubinemia. As we said, sometimes we need to do exchange transfusion. Um, if there is any permanent neurological sequelae, we have to educate the family on how to deal with it. You have to manage any feeding difficulties uh, to maintain good nutrition. Um, physiotherapy, because as I said, patient with connectedness, they will present with abnormal posture or acetosis. Speech and language therapy, if they have learning disabilities or speech delay. يعطيكم العافية